again, this is drawing the map uh, outlining the Android API permission mechanism. I'm Andrew Ryder uh, from Veracode. Uh, as you all well know, the Android Open Source Project provides a software stack for mobile devices. Uh, within this stack, they implement an application-based permissioning mechanism. Uh, however, as many of you may or may not know, um, when you get the SDK to develop some apps, uh, there's no permission map included. And by permission map, I mean something that will relate API calls to actually permissions that are required in order to successfully call those calls. Um, and not having this map sort of has a number of effects and, that I see. Um, and it increases sort of this, this notion of what is called a permissions gap or the likelihood of a permissions gap. Um, also, it increases the possibility of failing the principle of least privilege and also encourages um, the possibility of ill-conforming code. Um, it is also sort of my opinion that not having a map increases this overall lack of clarity. With uh, such a large project that Android is, uh, it should be pretty plain and obvious as to what permissions are required for which API calls and perhaps uh, you know, which uh, API calls require a number of permissions, that kind of thing. So it's in my opinion that having a map would help avoid this permission gap problem, which I'll discuss. Um, it would also help to uh, follow the principle of least privilege that we all in security know well about. Um, thirdly, uh, it will increase the, the dev and app security or an app analyst uh, work time. Uh, this is because they will have a ready file that will say these are the permissions that um, uh, an API call can have and then they can, when they do their analysis for uh, methods being used in, a, in an app, uh, they can say, okay, great, they've uh, used all the correct permissions and asked for no more. There have been some prior mapping attempts. Um, multiple research groups, uh, university-based, uh, have tried with varying degrees of success. Um, and really, as you'll see, there's no sort of one best solution for this problem. Um, and it was the goal of the research of myself and Zach Lanier, um, of, formerly of Vericode, to provide a more comprehensive and a reproducible methodology. So I ask of you to sort of listen uh, to an overview of permissions um, and sort of my arguments for why a map would be a good thing to have um, and survey a survey of four published uh, automated map generation methods. Um, you should sort of think about who might want to maintain such a map. It is in my argument that Google should. Um, but why aren't they doing that now? Um, and if not Google, who? So I ask you to just sort of think about that. So the API permissions are what are considered at the application level. And this is sort of versus the Unix traditional uh, user-based model. Um, now granted, in this, uh, there is some usages of groups and uh, group IDs at the lower levels, but really this is just buried underneath the application uh, scheme. Furthermore, uh, this is a fine-grained uh, scoping uh, permissions. That is, you have, say, you know, read-write contacts, uh, read-write uh, bookmarks, that kind of thing, rather than saying, you know, just a general per, uh, personal information permission. But it actually breaks down further. And in this case, when we're talking about API calls, we're actually talking about like public methods in Android.jar. And that's a generalization, but that's fairly pretty much what we're talking about. And in terms of permissions, they are just types. They're just strings. If you look at the Android manifest permission class, they're actually just static strings. Um, there are some defined elsewhere, but that's how they're defined. And in this talk, we're not, in this research and talk, we're not dealing with intents, um, and we're not dealing with third-party permissions. As you can see here, uh, if you just uh, hook up your phone or whatever Android device that you have, and you use uh, ADB, uh, you can query the package manager um, in order to list the permissions that have been registered within the package manager. And for these, we're not dealing with them. We're just dealing with the core Android API. So um, in terms of the permissions lifecycle, uh, you have the developer time. This is when you know developers writing an app and they need to use some method from the API and they say uh, something related to Bluetooth administration. Um, in order to successfully use that API call, they must actually add this Bluetooth admin permission to their Android manifest.xml. 
and the developer will compile their app and include this Android manifest.xml as, as, as deemed necessary. And um, the user will then attempt to install the application. Of course, this is just Instagram, just to show you the, the, the number of permissions that they're uh, requesting. But the idea here is to say that it's install time granting. Uh, you accept all or you not install. That's really a key point. Um, and when you accept, when you accept these permissions and allow the package manager to proceed to install the application of choice, um, it will register the app's terms in the system, uh, as well as dealing with the group IDs for lower level checking. And then furthermore, in the permissions life, uh, there's the runtime verification and validation of permissions. There's one thing to request permissions at install time, but permissions are actually verified at runtime. And they're verified uh, using a handful of methods uh, that are part of the API. The context object provides a few. Check, check calling permission, check permission. There's others, enforce calling permission. A number of others, there's about eight. Um, also, the package manager, as you might suspect, being the, the thing that uh, deals with packages being installed, <laughs> Uh, also provides such a method. Uh, method. This is a uh, check permission, you pass it a permission, you pass it a package name, it'll verify. Um, and all the locations throughout the API in which you actually do uh, verification of permissions um, at runtime are what we call permission enforcement points. Um, in this case here, and, and, and this is typical, uh, they'll attempt to verify that uh, a permission is, is had by the calling process. Um, and if it does not have that permission, it'll throw a security exception. That's the typical way to do it, but we'll see that that's not always how it is. And these permission enforcement points um, can be found throughout the, the, the API, but really what we see is that they're actually on the other side of the binder. That is, they're on the service side of the binder. The binder is like a lightweight RPC mechanism. Um, it's a local RPC mechanism since it's all you know, within your device uh, rather than going outbound to the internet or some other network. Um, and you can see here, you have your application over there on the left and it's using the Android API. And within the Android API, there's some proxies there for certain methods such as uh, uh, Bluetooth, uh, things of that nature. And what happens is that you'll call, uh, say, a Bluetooth get name function, and it'll dispatch a call into the binder and asynchronously get picked up by the Bluetooth service and actually execute that call. And during that execution of the call, it'll actually do, contain a permission enforcement point. And so it's there where it's checking the calling permission um, and verifying that this app over there was given the Bluetooth uh, permission, something of that nature. So we can actually see this in code. Um, we have here, we have the local side of Bluetooth adapter.getName. And you can see that actually there's this, inside of it, there's this return mservice.getName. And this is the call, the dispatch call to the binder. And then we have the service side of the Bluetooth, um, namely Bluetooth service. And uh, it, it, it actually does the, the context uh, classes enforce calling or self permission, and it attempts to check it against the Bluetooth permission. And upon success, this will return the get property name. Upon failure, it'll actually be throwing a security exception internally. Besides from the PEPs, um, there's actually lower level enforcement that occurs, and this is at a group, uh, Unix group level. Um, when you say okay to accepting the internet permission, for example, with Java Net socket and the need for INET address, um, uh, you're actually also uh, putting that application um, into the INET group. And so what happens is uh, with the socket support, it's actually wrap it, wrapped around the native uh, code. And that native code is doing some file system operations, and other lower level uh, operating system calls. And here, the, these uh, actions on the file system and other uh, operating system calls um, 
will actually need certain uh, group permissions in order to be called successfully. And so this is why you know, uh, your activity or, or app, uh, when it's running, will actually have the effective uh, and effective group ID of, of you know, INET when it's trying to access uh, sockets and stuff that. You can see uh, sort of the ugliness of the native code if you look at the uh, libcore code that's listed there. And you can see all the mappings of Android permissions to group values if you look at the source tree and look at frameworks-based data, et cetera, platform.xml. And so let's do sort of a basic example of a case of where you need uh, permission and uh, the failure versus success. So here I have an onCreate method, which is part of an activity. And basically, I get a handle to the Bluetooth adapter. And I am just attempting to call getName. This getName method requires the Bluetooth permission. Say if I did not provide it, um, I would get this uh, mess of errors. Uh, you'll see, I know this is kind of hard to see. Um, but you'll see here. The Java Lang security exception, need Bluetooth permission, neither user, blah, nor current process has Android permission Bluetooth. This is a security exception that's thrown on the binder service side. And then it'll actually come back and you'll get another exception, Java Lang runtime exception, unable to start activity, blah, 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 Java Lang security exception. So you get kind of like a double fault almost. So to speak. Now, if we did have uh, the permission in the Android manifest uh, XML, then we would just have things succeed. You recall the code here, I just log out to logcat. With a name that gets returned. Great. Excuse me. So there are a number of reasons that I believe that we need to have a map. Um, First is this permission gap problem, which I'll get into just in a few moments after this slide. Uh, the next is the principle of least privilege. And third is something that I think is extremely important and uh, would take care of a lot of the first two issues, um, which is if you had a map, you could easily integrate it into an IDE such as, such as Eclipse. So that if you did, you know, Bluetooth adapter, get name, and you wrote that in your code, then the IDE would either prompt you to add the permission to your Android manifest.xml or just would automatically add it. If you removed that method and other methods that required that permission, it would remove it or prompt you to remove it from the Android manifest.xml. Things that would aid the developer so that they weren't getting things incorrect from the beginning. Uh, also, it would be quite useful in security tools, such as those uh, wanting to verify that uh, an app uh, has the permissions requested that are only required of it. Uh, if, if you look at the Black Hat 2012 talk that Zach Lanier and I did, we presented some examples of incorrect documentation um, and misleading documentation, um, which also is a good reason for why we want to have a map. If the docs aren't correct, um, at least something other than that should be a basis for reality. Documentation is well known to all of us to not always be correct, and so you know, why should we be relying on it for something that's so important to a system? I mean, as we all know, security is important. So if we're telling people lies about what permissions are required for what, then we're not really helping the situation. And these other two are quite obvious. So the permission gap problem, um, any situation arising when the permissions requested by an application being installed do not match the permissions required by the application being installed. And I sort of like to think about this set theoretically. Um, let A be an Android app, let P of A be the set of permissions required, oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> P of A be the set of permissions requested in Android manifest.xml of, of the app A, and P star A be the set of permissions required by app A to run successfully. And as notation, let P1, P2, blah, 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 just be permissions within the system. So essentially, there's four granting cases associated with this gap problem. First is the ideal case, in which all of the permissions requested are the exact same as those required by the app to run successfully. Um, you can just verify this by doing uh, commutative uh, set theoretic complement and verify that they both are the null set. 
The next case, second case, is the overgranting case, which is the most worrisome. And this is when uh, P of A, the, the app requesting permissions, actually results in having more permissions requested than uh, are actually required. And this is a security issue, which we'll talk about further. Thirdly is undergranting, which is the opposite. Uh, your app doesn't request the permissions required to run successfully the, the methods used in. And the fourth, you can have both issues at the same time. And that's just overall mess. So the undergranting case, which is, uh, I would argue, less issue with security, um, maybe not, but somewhat, um, is the basic issue here is usability. Um, if I can't call uh, Bluetooth get names and have it returned successfully, then there's a deficiency in my code. You know, I'm expecting to have that get name to build up and use it for something. But if I can't actually get the name, then, well, there's a problem there, usability. And this often leads to uh, what I call a chaotic permission adding. And it's basically where developers are sitting there and they're like, I need to get this code working. Let me get this code working and let me just add every, every permission under the sun. You know, Bluetooth, Bluetooth admin, you know, everything. Access find location, you know, whatever, just to make sure that the code works and, and it's usable. And this sort of leads to this overgranting gap, or can. And the overgranting, as I had described it set theoretically, is a clear failure of the principle of least privilege. Um, obviously, you're asking for more permissions than you even need. And so that's quite obvious. Um, and the basic uh, sort of security implications that you might want to think about is say you're using a third party library such as an ad, um, such as an ad library, and your uh, game app uh, requests, not requires, sorry, requests internet, camera, and read contacts. You have some advertising library that you're using, and in reality, this get and load advert method will actually download some image that you can load and put into your app screen, right? But it notices that you have the camera and read contacts permission. So it's actually gonna also, while you're doing the get and load advert, it's also gonna do harvest contacts for spam and take pick and send. Now, the thing is, is that your game in this case, in this scenario that I'm presenting, your game did not actually need camera or read contacts. You were just, you just happened to have them there, perhaps by copying another project um, or other. And what this does is it actually allows them to do some evil, right? And that's kind of hidden underneath what their, what their goal is, which is getting load at. So obviously, uh, you would want to remove the camera and read contacts issue. Now, if we go back to this, uh, some of the other uh, security implications, um, I want to point you to this last one, this using other processes privileges. Some interesting work from Adrian uh, Porter Felt. Uh, the paper is listed in the references page, but I highly recommend it. Um, furthermore, uh, for other permission gaps, uh, the permission gap can occur uh, in, the, in the case of uh, copying or pasting old third party, uh, old or third party project. Basically, you know, when I'm writing an app, I always just copy, usually I just copy um, and paste something from before because I usually don't like to use Eclipse. I just like to, uh, you know, use Ant and the command line, stuff like that. So it's easier for me just to copy and paste. And I just wanted to uh, remind you of principle of least privilege. Uh, you all know it very well. Um, but, you know, the idea is that you must be able to, the app should only be able to access the information and resources that are necessary for basically allowing it to run in a legitimate manner. The map, as I argue, can achieve in this. Uh, but this now makes me wonder why there is no map. Um, well, Google, after having talked to their security team, um, or the Android security team, deems this a low priority. I'm sure they have plenty of number of other, other issues on their plate, but they say that this is, you know, not one with high priority. I tend to argue a little bit against that, but we have no real say there because we're not part of Google, or I'm not part of Google. Um, once there had been no map to start with, it's actually kind of difficult to create one, as we're going to see. And if you had one to start with, it's actually a little bit easier to build one out. 
you know, you can just do diffs between versions and it would take some hand analysis. But, you know, doing the diffs between them, at least you have a baseline to start with and give your, uh, and give the next map that you generate for the next revision some basis of belief. Um, as I stated before, multiple researcher groups have attempted this, but it's a tough problem. So why is it a tough problem? Well, the sheer size of the API. This is huge. Um, and not all permissions are checked in the same manner. Uh, yes, there were the API methods that I presented earlier, but there are other ways that permissions could be checked. And so we have to worry about those when trying to generate this map. Also, check failures are not all handed in the same way. If I were to do a dynamic method for generating this map, I would have to do some log analysis, and with inconsistent logs, well, that's going to be a problem for basing assumption in a tool to actually harvest the permissions out of those logs. Um, and then obviously it's moving target. You know, uh, pushing out new API revisions, you know, you're going to have to regenerate a map. There's going to have to be a team or somebody that's always going to be focused on generating this new map. And the last one here is the most important one uh, for everybody, I think, is that there's no kind of ground truth to really test uh, your map to be correct. If there was something that you could say, is my map correct compared to this thing? Well, you'd already have the map. The only way to actually verify things is to know you have good test cases with valid arguments that should run, and then actually run them and verify things work. So in terms of numbers, look at this. Um, the numbers of permissions over API calls, or sorry, over API revisions. Um, is ever increasing. Um, strongly linear, linear, and if we sort of project out to Rev30, there's gonna be over 150 permissions. That's quite a lot and quite a lot of fine grainness and subsystems to be thinking about. Also, uh, there's this ever increasing class count. Uh, there's, you know, it was a Rev10 added NFC and uh, things of that nature. So as hardware, more hardware comes out, um, there's going to be the need for more classes to support that hardware and therefore more code to analyze. And to really sort of emphasize this is the, the number of methods that we have here. If we, the blue is actually methods plus constructors and the red is just methods alone. Um, but, you know, if you look at this and you project out to Rev30, you've got about 36,000 methods that you're going to have to analyze. And then think about different arguments if you're doing it dynamically. Relating to this check analysis issue, uh, say you're doing static analysis to attempt to generate this map. Um, well, you have, first of all, you have to get a grip on all the API methods, such as those in the, in the context class, and that provided by the package manager, and get a grip on those. So there's a few there that you need to worry about. But then you also have to worry about these edge cases. Basically, as I told you before, permissions are just strings in Java. And so what can happen is this case here where they would do this service in info object requested from the package manager, and um, they just do a dot equals to compare this uh, binder, bind wallpaper string to the string that gets returned from uh, SI permission. So that's not like your standard uh, PET point. It's non-standard, non-conforming to the API. And then lastly, uh, in terms of check analysis, if you have group ID enforcement, there is no check permission call. It's done by the OS and then re gets returned up when you hit an error upon, upon verification time. And so, you know, how are you supposed to look for that? Um, also, other complications. Uh, since these are just strings that we're dealing with, uh, one, in the API code could conceivably uh, define a local string that's just Android permission, Android manifest permission, uh, Bluetooth, and pass that as an argument uh, to the check permission uh, function. So your, your code, your analysis code, actually has to be aware of local variables and keeping track of those, not just actual method calls and analyzing the arguments to that. Uh, another real big concern with these check issues is the fact that some API methods uh, logically are, have multiple permissions that can be associated with them. 
And they'll be associated in and or ways. Meaning, you know, if you have the bind wallpaper or the read context permission, you can do something. Um, or you might need both. And in this case, it's hard with dynamic analysis because you might only test uh, the code to a point where it will return failure on one, of its, on one of the verification points. And so you'll believe that the only permission required for this API call is the one that you first triggered the security exception on. Whereas maybe there's another layer or another layer or two there that you need to get past in order to recognize all of the permissions required. Furthermore, uh, dynamic analysis is the log message inconsistency. Um, the top, we have a fairly standard uh, output um, where they have thrown a security exception. And we saw this before with the Bluetooth example. But now below, where we have an app that doesn't request the, permit, uh, the internet permission, and we actually get a socket exception. And you can actually see the e-access permission denied there, uh, which is coming up from the OS call. And these are totally different from each other. They're, they're totally dissimilar. And from a log harvesting to generate uh, a method to uh, permission, you know, you're gonna have, you, you don't have enough uh, basis of assumption to build a tool in order to help you out with this. Um, also, a very key important difference is that at least in the Bluetooth case, they're telling you the permission that you need. But here, they're not even telling you. In the bottom case, they're not telling you at all that you need the internet permission, and that's really what you need. And uh, again, uh, in terms of difficulty with results analysis, there's no ground truth. So really what you have to do is say, other people that are generating maps, other researchers out there that are generating maps, let's compare them. Let's see how, you know, what our beliefs are uh, together. And if there are differences, maybe hash those out um, or not. Um, but the problem with this is that they're not all correct. Each method for generating their maps has shortcomings and fallbacks. And, and if you can't rely on the correctness of them, and you have something incorrect in your map, and you're validating them together, well, they just double validated in bad permission mapping. So it's a problem. We'll talk about this dynamic side product later. Um, so, these numbers of reasons that I went through, the check analysis, the log analysis issues, the numbers problem, is basically why uh, there have been multiple uh, solution attempts to this. Um, people have said, well, if I went about it this way, I'd have this problem. If I went about it this way, I'd have this problem. You know, so they each tried their own. So let's go through some of these. I list these in chronological order according to published date because I'm not trying to give preference to anyone. Um, I think they're all legitimate ideas and uh, worth thinking about and possibly uh, enhancing or merging with some of the others and to come up with a more comprehensive solution. First we'll go over the Berkeley method. Uh, this is work done under David Wagner and Don Song. Uh, many of you may re remember Dawn Song from well, a lot of work, but one of the things she did in the early 2000s was looking at SSH connections and um, basically came up with the, the idea that, you know, if you look at an SSH connection for long enough, you can begin to recognize patterns and then begin to sort of determine what's going on in that session. And so she was one of the ones that pushed for uh, doing random padding of packets, SSH packets, and that kind of thing to throw off eaves eavesdroppers. Um, this was presented at ACM uh, Computer and Communication Security 2011. Um, so their approach basically, uh, they will generate an app, or multiple as you'll see, uh, that calls like every API method within the, within the Android.jar. And it'll do it with varying arguments. And when it creates the APK file, it will put no permissions in the Android manifest.xml. The idea here is that when you call any method that requires a permission, well, you have no permissions requested, and so it should throw a security exception. And from there, they can harvest those from the log cap. Um, but the problem is, as we saw, is the log inconsistencies. So uh, 
basically what they do, is, they don't specify in their paper exactly how they do it. But the way uh, I would do it is just uh, wrap uh, each API call to catch the security exception and have a nice route. And the basic flow of how their stuff works, they do this test generation, they run the APK, and then they do a log analysis. In the APK generation, besides from no permissions in the Android manifest.xml, uh, there's a number of steps that require real work. Um, and the first is they analyze the android.jar to see what, uh, what they actually should be calling, um, which methods uh, and things of that nature, um, as well as they look up types, data types. Um, the reason for this is that in order to call Android methods, you actually need to have, to have arguments to those methods. And they're not all going to be string or int or basic data types. They're going to be more complex object types uh, that are part of the Android API. And so they have to create a variable pool. And that's, you know, so I can say, uh, I need to create test case blah, and I need uh, Android type Bluetooth adapter to keep using that. Um, and well, hey, they have one ready in that pool to, to be used. So that's great, that's helpful. Um, they must also generate uh, object instantiation code. And this can either come from constructor, as you know, or uh, static methods, uh, where maybe you need to get a handle to a service or a service manager class. Um, and then lastly, they need to generate the method calling code. And in this, they need to have, uh, it is ideal to have varying arguments. And the reason for that is to hopefully uh, test the code well enough so that you can trigger any security exceptions that would occur. Um, yeah. But this method uh, has some clear drawbacks. The first and uh, foremost is, are they running this, these APKs with no permissions on an emulator, or are they doing it on hardware? If they're doing it on an emulator, they're clearly not going to handle the Bluetooth stuff. They're clearly not going to handle the NFC cases. So there's issues there. They're going to miss permissions based upon that. So they have to run on hardware. But running on hardware has its own issues, as we all know. Next issue is this called calling, called code calling <laughs> and system state. Uh, basically, uh, if you're calling methods within the API, and the first argument to some method to some method is an integer, but really it's expecting some enumerated type from values 0 to 10. But you keep giving it 1,024. Well, clearly that's not going to help in terms of actually trying to successfully run the method and actually successfully trying to get to the security exception state. Uh, also, call ordering can be important. Uh, if you make one call ahead of another, perhaps that changes the system state so that uh, you have some issues in terms of triggering a security exception. I already mentioned the failure to, failure to discover the logical and or cases. Um, but a major problem here is that they need to test all of these methods in order to verify that they've got all of the security exceptions thrown and can harvest all that data. And there's, at this point, over 29,000. And then you vary those method arguments. That's a, that's a lot of test cases to be generating course of doing this automatically. Um, however, there are cases where they do it manually. Um, so in terms of availability, uh, they released no code. Um, but they did put up a website, androidpermissions.org, which was housing uh, permission maps that they generated. And they housed them and said they weren't necessarily correct. And we're always offering for people to submit uh, fixes to them. So that doesn't really make you feel very good, even though the people working on the problem are very reliable. Um, but as you can see here, the website's been down. Um, it said it was going to be packed July 5th. Yeah, I checked that yesterday, I think. And it's not up. Um, I also saw something on the Berkeley website about some, pul some work that was uh, redacted. And I couldn't find a clear uh, uh, website describing what was going on there. But from what I feel is that maybe someone in their own group was like, this isn't really up to snuff. So let's sort of unpublish this. <laughs> Gives you real faith. 
Um, so this is a, sort of an aside to this. Uh, it's worth noting that they first tried doing the APK generation using Randu. Randu basically is a random uh, Java test uh, generator. It'll, you pass it a jar, it'll try to do its best at generating um, multiple calls to methods within that jar and throw out all sorts of different arguments and generate a whole bunch. Um, I, I decided to try to do this just to see how it worked. And I have to agree, agree with them. It was very unwieldy. But the biggest problem is, is that you had to then modify the, the setup so that you weren't generating just one APK. You were quickly going to hit the, the method reference limit, which is 64,000 or 64K. Um, it's also JUnit heavy, and it was hard to integrate Android types and hard to control as written in Java. So they wrote their own tool, and as you'll see, I wrote my own tool, or we wrote our own tool. Uh, departing from dynamic analysis, you have the University of Luxembourg and Lille methods, uh, done in work under Leitron and Non Peru. Uh, this was published on archive, but I'm not really sure if it was uh, discussed anywhere uh, publicly. Um, they use a forward static analysis approach. Basically, what they do is they say, uh, we're going to build a call graph of the android.jar, uh, and we're going to attempt to go from all the method calls and try to find the uh, permission enforcement points. And if they can find from an, a method call, if they find a permission enforcement point, well, they know that that, met, that API method requires that permission. And so, sort of a flow graph of what they do. So for each class I, for each method K, go through this whole step of iterating through the tree generated by the entry point that is uh, method K. And they're using this uh, library called Soot, which is an optimization framework. Um, it can be used on Java source, uh, jars, or intermediate representations. Um, the main issues to note is that they must iterate through all the API calls like the, the dynamic did. Uh, the call graph is extremely heavy. And uh, they do not get to the lower level uh, uh, group checks. And it's not clear as to how they mark PEPs in their tree. There's no code available, and they don't release any maps for analysis. Uh, the work done by uh, Zach Lanier and myself um, was in the spring of 2002, and basically it's a hybrid static and dynamic approach. We use source uh, analysis to uh, get a baseline map, and then we generate all these APKs with no, uh, manifest, no permissions to manifest.xml uh, and try to run that and harvest the logs in order to uh, determine uh, what we had missed from our static analysis approach. In our backward static analysis approach, we use, uh, we basically take a look at each um, PEP point and then uh, using the tool Cscope, which we've modified to better handle Java and the uh, the interface description language from Android. Um, and, we, and we say, find this symbol, which basically means find all the points in the tree where there's a permission enforcement point. And then we go through each one of those permission enforcement points, and we attempt to do find all the methods calling them. Check all those methods. Are any of them API methods? If they are, great. Add them to the map. If they're not, continue. Find out which methods are, being, are calling that method that is it an API call? Are any of those API methods? Continue the process out to the graph's edge based from the PEP start. And the thing is, is it's a lightweight call graph. This is because all we're doing is uh, querying an indexed uh, source index, basically. And there's no just graph with nodes and edges that is loaded into a file. So this is just a description of the thing, of the, of the process and the backward static reaching process. And then we go on and use a uh, dynamic analysis approach. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's a failover. Uh, in this case, we'll catch things such as uh, internet because we actually try to create a socket. We actually try to go out and connect to something. Um, and we, this is sort of similar to Berkeley's method. It's, they're, they're, they were the inspiration for this part. Um, we have a variable pool for arguments. We generate calls via Android, uh, the, the jar uh, analysis. And we put no permissions in Android manifest.xml. And also, we generate multiple APKs in order to avoid the re method reference limit. 
So then we take the, the static and dynamic part, uh, maps that were generated and we merge them. And any conflicts, we have to hand analyze. Uh, so some basic issues to know with this is that you need the source code. And as anybody who's downloaded the Android source code, it takes time. <laughs> it takes a while. Um, it's also a two-step process, which might be a little off-putting. Um, and uh, conflicts in map merging is a problem. Uh, because that then requires manual investigation. And the whole goal with this is to make this automatic. We also don't provide any code. We don't provide any maps. <laughs> Which I'm not sure I should be laughing about. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway. Uh, but there are some positives to this. Uh, the fact that uh, it really, by having this sort of two-sided approach, uh, you're going to reduce your uh, reliance on manual methods over the long term. And as a side benefit of generating these dynamic cases, you're actually uh, generating test cases at the same time. All you need to do is add permissions and validate that things ran okay. So I'm going to mention this and skip over it due to time. Uh, the University of Toronto has done um, a backward reaching static analysis approach where they use soot uh, to analyze the Android jar binary. Uh, basically what they do is similar to us, they go from the PEP points back to the entry points. So they you know, find all calling uh, all calling methods of a check permission case and compare any of those callings to API methods. They are added to the map, et cetera, et cetera, and iterate through. Um, they actually do publish their code and some maps. Um, PScout is pretty good. Uh, I've gone through it. It's a little bit complicated, um, uh, but as many of these are, you're dealing with a large source base, you're dealing with um, a large jar file <laughs> dealing with a lot of code. Um, they provide uh, maps for those as of uh, last week, and I'm out of time. Um, so let me just close with this. Uh, dynamic approach to this problem, there's a lot of fault, there's a lot of issues. Uh, there's long term manual work required, an increased failure to find permission mappings. Um, also, uh, but with the static methods, it's a little bit more reliable, but there is some manual work in terms of patching uh, the call graph for the binder, um, need to handle group permission cases, um, such as internet, and uh, um, yeah. Uh, so, but the, the, the last benefit of the dynamic is that you get these validation test cases for free. So as you can see, it's a mixed bag, right? There are some positives, there are some negatives. Each requires a little bit of manual. Uh, each has its good, uh, automagically map generation part, but there is always some work. Um, let me just finish with this. So these two things are the most important part, in my opinion. So what is the solution? Either Google or a stable third party organization is going to maintain this map. Uh, they're going to have to invest in creating the old maps that are valid and mandate that SDK, each SDK released has a map. Um, I believe it should just be in the platform's Android Rev map directory. It should look something like this. You know, you have the permission call on the left, and then the, or the, the API call on the left, and then the permission on the right. Flat file, easily to correct. You can find, you can diff it between different versions, that kind of thing. But it's still an open problem. All maps are generated, validated, made public, and funds are there. Until that happens, we're not going to have a real solution to this problem. References are available if you look at the slides online. And thank you. I apologize for running out of time. <laughs> <laughs>